Whoever had me doing on the official time. It's exactly <laughs> 32 seconds past. <laughs> the clock in the hall is incorrect, so we will uh, continue. Uh, uh, Chairman Ulrich is not here today. He's uh, ill, so I'm going to be pinch hitting for him. Uh, if we can have a roll call. Barrett. Here. Kavanaugh. Here. Gay. Here. Green. Here. McGuire. Here. Mines. Here. Weber. Here. Item number two, announcement regarding public notice of meeting. Notice of the time and place of this meeting was publicized by notifying the area news media, by publicizing the same in the Omaha World Herald and outlets, by displaying such notice on the arcade level of Energy Plaza since June 14, 2013, and by mailing such notice to each of the district's directors on that same date. A copy of the proposed agenda for this meeting has been maintained on a current basis and is readily available for public inspection in the office of the district's corporate secretary. Additionally, a copy of the open meetings law is available for inspection in the public meeting book located in this meeting room. Item number three, review of the April 2013 comprehensive financial and operating reports and approval of the minutes and the excused absence of directors Gay and Mines for the last meeting. So moved. Second. Okay. We have a vote. Barrett. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Weber. Yes. Motion carried. Item number four. Persons wishing to address the board of directors on a particular <laughs> item are asked to approach the microphone as that agenda item is discussed. Comments will be heard following board discussion of the item and prior to a vote by the board. Persons wishing to address the board on all other matters will have an opportunity before the close of the meeting. Item number five, resolution number 5961. Now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the Health Plan 2012 Annual Report on the District's Self-Funded Health Plan, a copy of which is attached hereto, is hereby approved. Thank you. Um, all the directors have been provided a copy of this report and approved the report today. Some of the key points include uh, in 2012, uh, active retiree uh, medical, dental, pharmacy, and administrative fees totaled approximately $62 million. The employee and corporate contributions were around $7 million, reducing the uh, district district obligation to around $55 million. This was a 4% uh, increase from 2011 which is you know, below the marketplace uh, increases of roughly 8% on average. Uh, there are two uh, other funded <coughs> reserves maintained uh, for the health as well. One reserve uh, is a company and is being filed and, and processed. That is called the incurred but not presented reserve. Um, the balance on that fund is approximately $2.3 million. A second reserve uh, ensures the fund that the funds will be available during each ensuing month and is called the monthly claims and expenses reserve. I guess the money that's in the bank for it to pay bills that come along each month. And the balance on that fund is a, just short of $2.8 million. Um, the reserve balance has changed uh, based on, on annual projections and actuarial information that we receive. So if no, no one has any questions, we'll need to uh, approve this. Uh, okay. this report. Are there any comments from the board? Any questions? Just that uh, this is required by state <coughs> law because we're a self-insured, uh, self-funded plan as a political subdivision. With, and we do that because uh, it does save us money. Blue Cross is the administrator and uh, we have stopped gas, gas coverage at the top for, ex for extraordinary years. And so um, I join Director Kavanaugh in recommending our approval of this time. I do like that stop gas coverage. That's good. Is there any comments from the public about this item? Okay, we will have a vote. Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Weber? Yes. Motion carried. Mm -hmm. Item number six, resolution number 5962. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the proposal of Harold K. Schultz Company in the amount of $749,000 for the purchase of 15 KB metal clad switchgear for substation 6815 is the lowest and best bid received on request for proposal number 3995 and is hereby accepted. So moved. Okay. Director Weber? Madam Interim Chairman members of the board. Uh, this item, uh, the purpose of this item is to purchase a 15 kV metal clad switch gear for the substation 6815. The switch gear is required for the new substation for work associated with off at Air Force Base including serving the new Stratcom building. Six proposals were received, three are legally and technically responsive. The engineer's estimate for this project was $675,000. We're asking that uh, the board give us authorization to award the contract to Harold K. Scholl's company in the amount of $749,000 for the purchase of uh, this equipment. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Yeah. Where's this going to be at? Going to it. Yeah, it'll be off the base, just off the base, so we can uh, uh, get to it easily without having to go through the security when we do maintenance. So it's going to be outside of security so we can get to it. Correct. Okay. Um, well, I, have, I have a question. Um, how many switch gears do you anticipate to go into this new substation? Uh, that would be it for now. Okay. That would be it for now. We do have two circuits. Uh, that will supply power to uh, to Stratcom. One will be from this sub, and another circuit from will be from different sub uh, to ensure reliability. Basically. Now, is this switch gear? Are these components? Are they built uh, from scratch uh, by the Schultz company, or are they uh, manufactured by a different company? G. No, Schultz does the whole work. Okay. Yeah. They get the material and they build them. They've been doing that for a long time. We've we've had a really good experience with them. Okay, thank you. No, no. Are there any comments from the public on this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you you're welcome to come down to the uh, uh, state your name and address. Yeah, we'll be happy to. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm just curious. My name is Joe Peterson, I'm from Omaha. And I'm thinking about the Stratcom base. I'm curious about, there's several questions that come to mind. And if you don't mind, I'll just ask them. One is the security issue of having an uh, electronic switch from the, the city that feeds the base. Is that a problem for the base? Um, I think I will ask as far as security issues. To is there a security issue related to the, what, I don't know what that power feeds, you know, what that particular switch will feed, but I would think. Is that an issue? Is that a concern? Is that something the city should be aware of? You sort of mentioned that she didn't quite. Right. If I understand your question correctly, we do have two circuits supplying the uh, the Stratcom building, and this would be one of them. And we don't believe we have any uh, security issues. Do you know what I mean? As far as the base goes, if you're feeding power to the base, is there any problem with uh, someone messing with those lines for the base, or? Would the city have some problem? And that's all I was asking. Which city? You mean Bellevue? Uh, yeah, Bellevue. Well, because well, Bellevue is the jurisdiction down there. Okay. Yeah. I, it's going to be no different than it's been for the last 50 years. I, I was just when curious. Was, when it was the SAC headquarters. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not challenging it. I was no, just no, curious. So I thought. You think it's like a, a terrorist attack or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Right. I'm so sure the base has a. Uh, yeah. I'm sure the base has, has a lot of measures in place uh, that we're I'm not, sure. we're not just... involved in. But on our side of the business, the two circuits are pretty secure. I, that is a, maybe a silly question, but I just had it, so okay. I was going to throw it out up there. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Is it an upgrade or a replacement? It's a brand new substation. It's, an, it's, a, it's a brand new switch gear. Okay. Is there so a, it's neither. And then one other question. Is there any kind of like smart grid, you know, 
electronics being deployed at this time, when you, and, and with the transformer issue too. I'm just wondering if any kind of smart grid technologies are being deployed while you replace the switches and the transformers. Correct. All the relays that we have in place in the new substations uh, will be used to uh, uh, move forward with the smart grid when the time is right. So all the electronics are microprocessor-based relays, which uh, lend themselves to being a part of the smart grid in the future. Ready for a vote from the board? Well, I was going to say, if there was a time where I used to think I was smart, now my grid is smarter than me, my phone is smarter than me, and my water is smarter than me. <laughs> yes. Okay, we'll take a vote on that one. Thank you. Barrett? Yes. Gay? Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Weber? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. Yes. Item number seven, resolution number 5963. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the proposal of CG Power Systems USA, Inc., in the amount of $1,231,200 for the purchase of two 161 13.8 kV 1830-33 MVA power transformers is the lowest and best bid received on request for proposal 4003 and is hereby accepted. Director Kavanaugh? I mean, Weber? <laughs> you it is, it is, it is, it is Dr. Weber's. Thank you very Weber's. much, Mr. Green. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Weber, it's right. yours. This item deals with the purchase of two MVA transformers. They will be used at the new OPPD substations 1260 and 1367. Ten proposals were received, four are technically and legally responsive. The engineer's estimate for this contract was $1,270,000. The board's being asked to authorize the award of the contract to CG Power Systems USA, incorporated in the amount of $1,231,200 for the purchase of these two transformers. Is, is this a typo, or am I? Is it an adjusted bid? But in the uh, in, our, in our, our proposal, or our board action, it says 1.231 million. So looking at the list of proposals, um, CG Power was about ten thousand dollars less. Than that. Is it just a typo? <coughs> Can we verify that, or is she going to verify that? Which is the correct number? Yeah, sometimes we ask for additional components as optional. Okay. So if we need them, we buy them. If we don't need them, we don't buy them. And I believe that's one of those. Okay. Just a small item. Okay. Um, on these, so two trans these are new as well. As far as where they're located, I see one's 120, Correct. Both of those are new locations. Because of growth in correct. those areas. Yeah. And then the other one's at 184th and Blondo. High growth areas. Mm -hmm. Same reason, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Are there any questions from the public or comments from the public? Barrett? Yes. Okay. Yes. Green? Yes. McGuire? Yes. Mines? Yes. Weber? Yes. Sir. Kavanaugh? Yes. Motion carried. Item number eight. Resolution number 5964. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of Directors of the Omaha Public Power District that the guidelines for participation at OBBD Board of Directors meetings, as set forth on Exhibit A, attached here to B, and hereby are approved. So moved. Second. Mr. Green? What we're trying to do is formalize procedures that we've had in. Uh, informally in place for a long time and we thought that would be for the benefit of the board and the benefit of the public coming to speak so that they'd know ahead of time where they were supposed to go and how long they were supposed to be and what and what was expected of them and then what they could expect from us from respond from questions and as you can see uh, it really wouldn't change what just happened here and in fact I was kind of pleased to see there's so much interest in uh, a substation because that's usually one we don't get anybody to 
interest in whatsoever. They have been the location. But uh, uh, NPPD has one, and it's on their website. And a lot of this comes from that. In addition, we checked with the other, other um, elected bodies around, the county board, the city council, and UD school board, to see what they did for public participation. And so uh, we kind of took some of those concepts and amalgamated them into what was handed out to each one of you as you came in today. And we're going to post this on the website so that if somebody new wants to come down and speak, uh, they won't have, won't be, feel insecure in doing it and not wanting to do it because they don't know what the procedures are. And uh, then they, if the board doesn't respond the way that they would want to in a conversational manner, that, that they shouldn't feel offended by that way. It's, it's in order to keep things orderly and moving along. And uh, over the years, uh, people have said some things to us which have offended some board members and not others. Uh, the best example is when I think the people in Boyd County told us they'd kill us the next time they saw us. But other than that, uh, <laughs> uh, keeping, the, keeping the comments clean, uh, outsiders, Customer owners record us. We're going to start recording our, ourselves and making that available and things like that. We're doing it on a test basis now to see how it works. And uh, so that uh, we can efficiently move the meetings along. If there are a lot of people who want to come and speak, we can uh, encourage them to pool their resources and have one or two people speak rather than have 30 different people speak on the same topic with using the same words or reading from the same speech. So uh, this is not something to belittle anybody or to do anything like that. It's simply to put into place, in a written form, the policies and procedures that we have informally followed for many, many years. And so that's why this is out there. And we, I wanted to do, we wanted to do this as a board resolution <coughs> so that it would be publicly uh, discussed and publicly approved. Last month, there was a, uh, a customer owner who came and was confused as far as the procedures and didn't know when to get up and that kind of stuff. And this would help in the future, especially for new people coming, that they're more comfortable as far as when to put in their input and everything else. So, are there any other comments from? Uh, Director McGuire, I have a comment on, on number five. I think that's important, uh, says the chairperson may at any time limit or extend the amount of time a speaker may have to comment. Mm -hmm. Um, I did have a right. concern about giving somebody a three-minute window or whatever. Um, the reason I say that, that's for the public's benefit. It's a once-a-month meeting, and when they come in, and, and that's why we changed it, because I know, and I appreciate that. The, uh, but, you know, it's once a month. They get nervous. They come down three minutes, might go by real quick. But right. the chairperson can always at any time extend it, but also maybe 120 people could fit in this room. And if everybody came up and wanted to just go on that's not respectful to everyone else in the room either. So I was really pleased to see that in there. And I think the yeah, the, the can, of time can can use their is yeah, yeah, they so feel that, that benefits it needs to be further discussed. And respects everyone else who wants to make comment on another issue positive. So exactly. I'm glad to see that. Yeah. What we're asking for is respectful discourse. Are there, we'd uh, appreciate comments from the public on this. David Corbin, 1002 North 49th Street. I just want a clarification on the, the first paragraph says you do not have to identify yourself and then... Yeah. You don't have to identify, it's in the state law. You don't have to identify yourself to come to the meeting, but you may be required to identify yourself when you speak for the record. No, but we do have to identify ourselves to get in the building. No, no. Oh. Yes, we have to sh we have to show our ID card and we do get signed in. So that's why I'm asking for clarification because it seems to contradict. We Perhaps it's that's the building. Yeah, I think that needs to be clarified. That's uh, yeah, because we don't enter the meeting room, but we do to come into the building because of post 9/11 security. Um, and we do have to tell why we're coming in, which is to come to the board meeting. I appreciate that uh, comment. Well, comment. Let's, let's explore that. But I thought you were going to complain about the three minutes because most university professors can talk 50 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> not just professors. Is that a request? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, 
the Vernon Train 4728 cast. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for solidifying these rules, <laughs> making it clear for everybody. You know I testify a lot, and we have lots of back and forth. And, and if you start filming it, I wouldn't be here every time. I'm here because I'm filming it. A lot of, I don't care if you buy telephone poles or not, <laughs> you know, and things like that. So there's lots of issues. I don't need to be here. You're saving you some money, Laverne, so. What was that? You're saving you some money on this, and you can... Well, that would be great. And the fact that you don't have to show ID two extra minutes in the morning of sleep. I'm a nighttime worker, <laughs> so that's fabulous. So I just I wanted to compliment you on what you've done here. I really did. and that's. The we may have to amend it, though, that when you approach the microphone yeah. to speak, you should walk rather than run. <laughs> I don't want to waste time, and, I, and I'm very excited. I get very excited. And, and But we did have to give our names at the door. They didn't ask for ID. They just no, said, what's your name? So I, that's it. But I, otherwise, I'm really glad you did this. Yeah, how can we clarify that, and can we get some feedback on it's that? It's not required. So it's a security issue. It's, it's a security issue. I think that's appropriate for security. Right. Issue. It's very important for security because if in the event that there's a fire or something happens in the building, we'd like to have records of who's actually in the building so that we understand how to handle security and, and, and safety. And so when people come into the building, we ask them to supply their names. Do they have to supply their ID? And why do we? Um, yeah. And that's to verify identification. Do we need to amend what it said then? Somebody who's on the road. Profile. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would. I would think. You'd be, I think you'd be flattered court. that yeah. they weren't asking for anything from you because you're regular. Well, okay, so. Oh yeah. Okay. We'll clarify it. Let's Excuse me, on. I think I've got, Mr. Gates might have the answer here. Let's make it a little clearer. And we can uh, clarify it and always, and we get comments, we look at them, but they're, they're two separate issues. Once to get in the facility, which is where we ask for the security precaution, to actually get in the board meeting, you can obviously don't need any ID or any questions in this, uh, this meeting. If we're outside of the area, if obviously the board meeting is being a place that wasn't in a, in a facility of high security, we just open it up and we've done that before in our public meetings. So it's really a separate security issue for the facility. It's based on input we've had from uh, inspections by Homeland Security, I believe, Drive has been here, uh, and recommendations to implement those kind of security measures within the facility. Okay. Okay, Joe Peterson again. Uh, I have a couple of just comments. Number one is that I'm grateful for Nebraska for its public power system. And I, I, I'm also grateful that we're called consumer, um, you know, it's consumer driven and that we are cooperative partners in this whole endeavor that's public power. And that to me is important and I loved, you know, I want to hopefully keep, I hope that this stays and I hope that we can continue to work cooperatively as a state to make, you know, to make sure that that happens. So. The idea that says how do we do that cooperatively and how do we speak to each other respectfully, I think is critical. And I think it's critical that you that those uh, clarified expectations are written down so that you can say this is important. I mean, even maybe so. Just as an editing thing and teaching at the college level, I could go on, but I just this is an <laughs> editing thing. Um, maybe making that a separate point about how to conduct oneself to make it clear that that is important and that is some. Uh, to make that particular uh, rule. Yes, you can speak for three minutes, and oh, by the way, next point, the way you speak. So they're two separate entities. This is an editing thing. And another editing thing would be number six, because number six, I think, um, does not clarify. It sort of says, and we can make any rules we want by the end of the day. Do you know what I mean? All the other rules, if we change these rules, then we don't need to make any of these other rules. So I think maybe number six could be erased, or at least modified somewhat to say something as um, there is of course the opportunity to make new rules if it's cooperative it's we will do this and the public can speak about this before we vote about this do you see what I mean so it's sort of that cooperative understanding all the way through this is what we do this is what you do this is how we act this is how you act so that there's that reciprocity so FYI, just, just, thank you. No, the lawyer in me says no. <laughs> yes. The lawyer in me back. says no. It's a catch-all. It just says that we aren't waiving any other, any of the other requirements uh, to come. 
so if we determine that security is appropriate at the door, that we haven't waived that because it's not listed in here. Okay, but if this could, this isn't clear to me about um, having the, and I teach policy, so I'm not a lawyer, but I do understand policy, and this is definitely vague. And so if you were to put in here, there's a reason for this, there's a rationale, or there is a process, I think it would be clear. That's all. Otherwise, it seems pretty vague and pretty uh, a blanket statement. Well, this this one I did steal from directly from NPBD, so I figured it was vetted by their lawyers, or it wouldn't have gone on their website. And in addition, um, sometimes vagueness in things are intentional. For whom? For everyone. And that's. That's so we don't waive anything. So somebody doesn't come up and say, "Well, you don't, you can't do that because it's not in your in this particular resolution." It's important to give the chairman some flexibility, I suppose, for unforeseen. Does, does it so we are we, cooperative. We does it also give our customer owners flexibility too? Is what I'm thinking with that statement. I don't think any substantive change would happen without this same policy coming back to the board. For, so for review and, and vote. That's all I'm saying. With comment, but review, and vote, some some uh, some additional yeah. cooperative uh, measure that uh, re reminds us that we are in this together and there is a reciprocal uh, relationship. Uh, that's. I know I'm going to finish this point, but I don't want to forget one more point I'd like to bring up. Well, I wanted to answer your okay. thing specifically, and I'll give you a specific example. Okay. Uh, Nebraska is now a concealed carry permit state. Mm -hmm. We don't allow concealed carry in the building for security reasons. It's not mentioned in this resolution. So that that prevents that argument of saying, hey, you don't have it in your resolution for public participation at the meeting. I should be able to come into your meeting with a concealed carry weapon. I and think so that, that should be that clear. those types of situations. But there's so many of them, it'd be, it'd be 10, 15 pages, and what if you could get something? It's supposed to be a short thing that people can be handed and say, here's our participation rather than a 35-page contract. Yeah. I, 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 so, I, I can, you know, I see the point from your side of the fence to say, okay, how do we maintain our process? How do we main, how do we get business done? How do we prevent somebody from Boyer County saying, threatening your life? I think cops should have been called, nine, you know, 911 right then. I would have called the cops on this. Some of us were that's, used to it, some of us were offended. obscene. <laughs> I, well, it's not, it's not right. So I can understand you're saying, how do we protect our process and protect our persons? That makes sense. Well, let's implement it and then let's see how it works. But I, well, because this is so vague, it may cut out the public process. That's my concern. It may be used to shut people down and shut people up, and I'm not good for that. <laughs> the other part of it is, um, there is this is about the consumer as if, consumer owner, if the consumer owner is uh, seen as us them, creating an us them, then I also think there should be a list of corporate entities who they should be um, somehow uh, also responsive to the consumer owner in terms of who's involved uh, in ter um, at the meetings. Does that make sense? It's sort of like, is there is there an us them situation setting up here? We don't think so. We're we're your elected officials. Yes, I know. You have to conduct the business we were elected to conduct. Right. And this this governs that. It doesn't put it in us and them in terms of the of, in terms of the participation of the meeting. There may be issues that become that way, but that's that's healthy discourse. Yes. But uh, in terms of putting in a procedure to follow for everyone to understand in order to get the public business done and to have the appropriate dialogue, something like this is warranted and necessary. And so I don't... Uh, parsing, I, I agree. Parsing, I... parsing about uh, a specific word here or there could go forever. I don't think this is parsing. The district may at any time make it enforce any other or additional rules regarding the conduct of persons attending or speaking at meetings of the board. Any is the word that I'm having a problem with. Thank you. You've exceeded your three minutes. Thank you. <laughs> it hasn't been voted on. Okay. <laughs> we will take our uh, customer owner's comments. And uh, do we have any other discussion about that? Do we want to get rid of the word any? No. <laughs> Attorney speaking. May we have a vote? Barrett? Yes. 
Gay. Yes. Green. Yes. McGuire. Yes. Mines. Yes. Weber. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Motion carried. <laughs> Uh, at this time, we have our uh, President's report, and we're going to have Mr. Yates. Thank you, Mr. Director McGuire. Uh, we'll run through the President's report, um, similar format to we've had in the past. We can anticipate that we're going to we'll continue to look at this to improve it um, going forward, so there will be some uh, improvements as we move through the process. But just well, to, uh, to the microphone. Is it on? No. There it is. I'll, I'll talk as loud as I can, John. How's that? Uh, and I won't use the technique if anybody can't hear me raise their hand. <laughs> uh, on, from production operations point of view, and this is in particular for the power plants, on Tuesday, May 28th, the Nebraska City 2 was synchronized at 423 in the afternoon after a 23-day outage. We discussed in the last board meeting uh, that we had to replace a section of the main steam piping, which needed replacement due to the bulge that had developed in it. That outage was conducted very well by the staff uh, down in Nebraska City 2. Brought the unit back in 23 days and is currently operating uh, well down there. We have reinstalled Sarpy County unit number 5B engine on May 8th and 9th, which was successfully tested and is now back to 100% availability. It's also of note that the North Omaha Power Station received the PRB Users Group Small Plant of the Year Award at a conference in Chicago on May 13th. It's an indication of progress at the station in reducing combustible dust, which is an issue at any power plant, and improving safety and plant housekeeping over the past five years. And the material handling group at North Omaha also did achieve a milestone of completing one year without an accident of any type. That's an outstanding achievement in, a, in an environment which caution is always used and does have uh, dangers involved in it. I'd also like to report with a lot of uh, effort, our renewable energy continues to contribute 7.4% of OPPD's retail energy sales in May, with a capacity of 49.6%. We are preparing also for integrating that into the SPP, our Southwest Power Pool, in the future. That uh, the renewable energy part, primarily wind for us, continues to operate uh, very well for us. Specifically on the Fort Calhoun station, uh, the unit remains in cold shutdown uh, with the fuel in the spent fuel pool, although that uh, will be changing shortly as we move toward reload of the core. We've completed many modifications at the plant and large projects. I'll just mention a few of them. The penetrations, containment penetrations, which have been discussed many times uh, in this uh, group as well as others, are essentially complete on the insulation and we're in the testing phase and that is uh, going to be complete very shortly and that's that's been a huge project for us and a good one uh, we're working on missile protection from tornadoes which is a remaining item uh, before our startup we have had an NRC public meeting on May 17th where it was briefed on some of our 350 inspections from last February so it was a while back we've had many inspections since then I'll cover some of those as we go forward on May 22nd we had a visitor visit by an NRC commissioner Ostendorf uh, he was here with the uh, regional administrator, Art Howell, and spent the entire day at the facility talking to people and doing detailed tours of the entire plant, including containment. That visit went very, very well for us. Also, was accompanied by representatives from Senator Mike Johans and Deb Fisher's office and Congressman Jeff Fortenberry. Our other two congressmen, Adrian Smith and Lee Terry, were represented in a previous tour by a commissioner, Magwood, of the site. On May 29th, there was an NRC briefing in Washington, D.C., which myself and Lou Cordopassi, our chief nuclear officer, uh, briefed the NRC on our current status. That meeting went uh, very well, and, and we've had good feedback on it, uh, had good question and dialogue with the NRC going forward. Now, to highlight some of the more recent inspections, uh, more recent than the May 17th exit, the NRC resident inspection, we have two NRC residents that are there full time, at their bi-quarterly exit meeting on Monday, June 3rd, the report did not contain any findings of significance. We've had a radiation protection inspection June 3rd through the 8th. That was a good inspection with no findings of significance. The license renewal inspection was also June 3rd through the 8th. That was conducted with no findings of significance. We're currently in a security inspection at the plant, as well as finishing up checklist items on the 350 checklist. We did conduct an emergency response drill Tuesday of this week, which went very well with accomplishment of 10 out of the 10 criteria. 
Port Calhoun continues to focus on the licensing basis, cap, and additional oversight, and completing our restart commitments. Uh, we're completing a, a large testing group right now. We call it Engineered Safeguards Testing. It actually tests all of our Engineered Safeguards features at the plant, and as a result, verifies much of the work that has been completed over the last two years at the plant. That testing is about half completed. We anticipate the completion of that testing this weekend, at which time we today we've completed our submittal on our containment internal structures to the NRC in final uh, verified condition, and they are reviewing that. We don't see any issues that will prevent core reload and eventual restart of the plant at this time. In the transmission and distribution area, we've conducted inspections on about our 1,275 miles of transmission. We do that from the air using a helicopter to look for any damage that may have occurred over the winter and prepare us for the summer. That inspection is complete and uh, we'll, we'll work on any items that have come out of that. We talked about two substations earlier in purchasing transformers. We have another substation, 1398, in the rural south rural area, which is a new addition. That has been completed. That's to supply load growth in Richardson County, and that was completed one week ahead of schedule. So that will support, the, there, there's a significant load growth in that part of our service area down toward Kansas border. We've also completed the substation in Sarpy County located at 27 and Platteview Road. And that's again to support load growth as Director Gay mentioned. We did have one significant thunderstorm come through our area on Sunday night, May 27th, the Memorial Day weekend. There was high winds and lightning and it hit the area about 1.30. We had about 6,300 customers out at the peak and we completed restoring that outage within a 24-hour period, so it was well done by the transmission and distribution group. Moving to the finance area, we've talked before about authorization for about $60 million in authorized bonds to refund bonds, which we had higher interest rates on. We tentatively are going to go to the market for the bonds in July. In the customer area, we've, uh, in the second phase of our stakeholder engagement process, which was brief briefed in detail at the committee meetings uh, to the board, we will be conducting 11 public open houses across the district beginning June 21st. That will provide the public an opportunity to comment on the draft stakeholder engagement framework, and then we'll move forward into the formal stakeholder process. And we've issued a press release on that and encourage on that and encourage participation in it. With the people, the team here at OPPD, uh, we are piloting a new partnership with Step Up Omaha. That's the Empowerment Network in the City of Omaha in collaboration with community partners working to bridge the employment gap and invest in the workforce for the future by recruiting, training, and preparing at-risk youth and young adults in our community to make positive life choices through career opportunities. We'd like them to come to work here. In addition, we've hired 22 seasonal employees and 10 co-op employees. Our summer program really provides a feeder for us for future, uh, the young generation folks, which uh, are doing quite well within the company itself. Uh, that concludes my report for this moment. Thank you. I'd uh, also uh, like to uh, point out that uh, the board did receive um, copies of uh, 622 uh, Sierra Club cards and 251 names uh, typed on plain paper. Uh, as far as commenting on this, uh, OPPD does remain in compliance with all EPA and environmental operating standards at North Omaha and its uh, fossil fuel facilities. And uh, Omaha is within its ambient air quality standards as well as monitored by a station near the North Omaha facility, which is responsible, which is the responsibility of the Douglas County Health Department. Uh, we're currently establishing a stakeholder process that many of our environmental groups are aware of and have participated. Uh, the uh, other thing that we're doing is that we're currently evaluating and ten uh, testing all potential options for future EPA uh, MATS regulations, uh, including uh, dry sorbent injection and activated carbon injection to reduce emissions even further than we have over the last 20 years. Uh, as far as on the renewables, we have continued to evaluate additional renewable uh, and other renewables, wind and other renewable sources. And currently, OPPD is projecting 15% of our retail sales to come from renewable sources uh, in 2014 with the addition of Broken Bow and Prairie Breeze Wind Farms. And we are continually looking for more also in that situation. So 
so if there's uh, any other comments on what I've said here from the board, if not, I'm going to open it up to the public for uh, uh, comment. Here. I have a comment. <laughs> um, this, I was not present last meeting, but I wanted to say this last meeting <clears throat> in April, a little story, late April, uh, there was an outage in Papillion, Bellevue on a, on a Sunday. The next Sunday, outage in Papillion and Bellevue. Um, and Mo and I talked on the third Sunday. Mo got a personal call on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, but anyway, I just wanted to comment him and his team. They did a great job. I mean, obviously, you know, to be that consistent, we've always had excellent service all the time. And it just so happened I was in the affected area. So I got my wife was not happy. But, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, it's, but anyway, it just it kind of in my mind. It, you know how it's so important what we actually do on the delivery and I know we talked about a lot of things but actually delivering the power to two homes well, anyway I just wanted to say uh, his crew and, and him are very responsive and these weren't big long ones but they went through and, and found out what the problem was and and but Tim Burke and I I mean we received some calls and, and you know the system where people were calling and, and uh, passed it on to their director who then you know, you've been through this a lot. I'm sure all of you who have been here here longer. This is your first I've, experience. Uh, well, you know what graduation parties were coming up, and it would be good if uh, I'm out there in some graduation parties and, uh, and powers out. They wouldn't have been happy to. No, but anyway, I just wanted to say to the tree trimmer. Great job. Yeah, I, I don't think it's trees. It was yeah. some other. It's some other pretty pretty big issues. Yeah. They took care of it over the course of a couple of weeks, and it's been you know knock on wood, it's been going great. So I commend you uh, for doing that, Mo. Thank you. And of course, if anything else comes up, I'll, we'll be in touch. But Director Dave, mm -hmm. this is a good example, I think, of of um, the issue of reliability. Mm -hmm. This our district has a 99 what. Point seven, somewhere in that area. Tim, though, reliability, which is unbelievable. But when it affects you, <laughs> yeah, that's a different yeah. deal. Three, the, so the, the idea, you know, first time is to pay that happens. Um, but it was something consistently that that was kind of whatever. I'm not gonna. I, we don't need to get into details. But they did find out what it was. You know, it's so odd it would happen the same time all the time. But, is all corrected, and it you know it costs a little money to correct that, obviously. But um, anyway, I guess it was my first experience on dealing with directly with with our senior team on um, on solving a problem, and they did a great job. So I wanted to say that publicly because I think we do need to acknowledge that publicly. And when it isn't so great, we'll we'll do that publicly as well. But thank you, Mom. Thank you. Any other comments, Phil? Just briefly, since uh, Director Ulrich is not here today, I, Director Ulrich, we want to thank the professional staff for improving the quality of reliability in the rural areas. <laughs> you could know, say that. Yeah. He'll be back next month to say that if he wants. Uh, next, I'll open it up to the public for comments. Good morning, my name is Ken Winston, 4905 South 149th Street, and I'm going to be very brief. Um, I guess there's a lot of people behind me. Uh, so basically, I'm, I'm going to just briefly talk about some opportunities for investment in renewable energy. The legislature just passed LB 104, uh, Director Gay is very well aware of that particular piece of legislation. And one of the things that that will do is to reduce the cost of developing renewable energy projects, and that uh, can help reduce the, 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 those savings can be passed on to, to your rate payers. <coughs> the second is the fact that uh, evidently the Obama administration intends to impose limits on, on uh, carbon, and that's going to impact coal uh, fired power plants, and so that indicates another reason to make more aggressive investments in renewable energy. And one of the areas that, that we're working on is uh, what are known as clean contracts, where there are incentives for people to invest in solar energy, and that's something I'd be glad to visit with, with members of the board or staff about that. And then I guess the final thing is just to suggest more investments in, uh, in more aggressive. I know that, that energy efficiency has long been uh, part of, of the OPBD's program, but the problem is how do you penetrate larger segments of the population? And I know that there's some programs out there that have been very effective, and we'd like to 
help support those kinds of things. And so we'd be glad to help in any, any or all of those endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minson. As I mentioned, that uh, we're projecting 15% by 2014. If you remember, a couple years ago, we were saying 10% by 2020. So we are on a roll. Well, and we and think that's working. great. And, and I guess one of the other things that we're concerned about is the fact that the federal tax credits may very well expire at the end of the year. So it's kind of like striking while the iron's hot. And we are very aware of that and are working very hard and, on it. And we appreciate that. And, and I guess I also want to note that when you <laughs> announced your 200 megawatts of wind development, we issued a press release. I, there was applause in the room when you announced that. I recall that. So, and we issued a press release hailing that. And we'll continue to support those efforts. So thank you. Thank you. David Corbin, 1002 North 39th Street. Uh, I just wanted to point out one thing that just came out recently. The global wind power now uh, in across the globe equals uh, all the power plants in Mexico, South America, and Central America. So that's how fast it's growing. But today, for the first time, I'm here representing uh, Nebraskans for Solar. Nebraskans for Solar is uh, attempting to raise money to for low-income housing and for schools and nonprofit organizations. And uh, our first uh, Habitat for Humanity home should be uh, uh, s solar. Uh, if, we ra if we raise more, we'll do more than one, but we should have the first home by uh, July. And I did want to point out that since uh, Secretary of Defense Hagel was here yesterday, uh, back at his alma mater, <laughs> And uh, one question that he was asked was about sequestration and how, how did that affect, and he was talking about all the dire effects that will have in the future. Despite those severe cuts in the Department of Defense through sequestration, the largest uh, and uh, uh, contract awards to the Department of Defense in the recent contracts were to the, uh, to the Army for $7 billion in renewable energy. So obviously uh, the Defense Department is heavily involved in this and one thing I wanted to just say about this, uh, U.S. solar production was up by 227 percent in the first quarter of 2013, that uh, you have that your green fund and MUD has their fund where people can uh, donate certain five dollars, ten dollars a month for people who can't afford their bills. I would like to propose that you give an option that uh, those who would be willing, and I think there would be a lot, and I think Nebraskans for Solar and other environmental groups would like to help you find those people who would add that for uh, a solar project for a nonprofit or for low income housing uh, so that we can get demonstration projects out there because I sense a strong. Uh, there, there's not a lot of uh, support that I've heard so far about solar in Nebraska, and they're doing it uh, better and stronger in Minneapolis than we are here. So we would like to help. We've offered it to help many other times. We really would. If you would like to consider something along those lines, I'd love to, to talk with you and, and help that, to make that happen. Mr. Gates would love to comment on that. Yeah. Appreciate that offer, Dave. We'll, we'll take you up on it uh, to ensure it. And, Mrs. Uh, Hutcherson. We'll, we'll talk to you about that. We, we're encouraged on, you know, we've, we've watched solar for a long time. We have solar at our new Omaha Center. Um, we've participated with Creighton on it, and uh, we continue to watch it uh, going toward the future. I think it is improving in cost. Um, Still got some few hurdles, as we all know. Yeah, we've got a lot of numbers for you and what the costs are, and, yeah, and we can yeah. give you. <laughs> we have to get together with you. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure what we know, too. Thank you. We actually, uh, some board members from LES and myself mm -hmm. and uh, Director Barrett toured both uh, Creighton's project <laughs> and also the, the other project in the Energy Center and are talking about that. And there's been a lot of lessons learned that hopefully we can put into action. Thank you. They they have and that's what that's what Thank was interesting you. how much it's changed and uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Patricia Fuller. I'm from Council Bluffs. Um, I have a couple of concerns since the last board meeting about some uh, statements made by OPPD's spokespersons. It's pretty well established that burning coal is one of the dirtiest ways of producing energy. It emits at least 50 different air toxics. 
which contribute to chronic heart disease, chronic lung disease, um, chronic bronchitis, asthma, premature death, lung cancer. And these uh, facts are supported by the EPA, the Clean Air Task Force, the American Lung Association, Harvard School of Public Health, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and the American Nurses Association. Yet OPPD spokesperson Mike Jones disputes the adverse health impacts of coal-fired power plants. According to Jones, air pollution in the plant's shadow is due first and foremost to cars. He says diet, smoking, and indoor air quality also factor into the area's health-related issues. Uh, the other concern I have, too, about uh, is the pollution regulations that are governing the North Omaha Station. OPPD Vice President Tim Burke says North Omaha Station meets the EPA guidelines. I guess my question is, what guidelines from what year and what specific pollutants? Uh, OPPD last renewed their air permit in 1997. Uh, we talked about ambient air standard qualities. Okay. Mr. Burke, would you like to answer that one? Well, certainly, uh, uh, as, uh, as all of our generating facilities, uh, we're required to uh, follow all EPA and state-regulated Department of Environmental Quality, uh, City of Omaha, uh, environmental standards for permit of any emissions of any of our plants, whether it's in the air, it's in the solids, it's in uh, our use of water. Um, and so OPPD mains within um, all of those permit regulations that we have with the Department of Environmental Quality in the City of Omaha and the EPA. Um, so those are the standards that we're set, that we measure, that we supply that information uh, through our production operations group to the EPA, City of Omaha, and DEQ to make sure that we um, maintain um, operating within those standards. And so uh, we currently operate within those standards, and our plan is to currently uh, and, and to continually operate within those standards. Uh, I think okay. right right now. Yeah, thank, oh. you. thank you. Thank you. Oh. That's if, you, if you'd like to continue the discussion, maybe with Mr. Oh. Burke, because okay, we're sort of way past our time on this. Considering okay. there's oh, so I don't have time for the last point then. Okay. Yeah, maybe later you can make okay. that point to us or whatever. Yeah. John Pollock, fourteen twelve North Thirty Fifth Street, Omaha. Uh, first, we're Getting into uh, peak uh, load season, uh, right now we've got uh, a weak uh, heat dome in the southeast U.S. and a strong but very sharp one that runs up from the southern Rockies all the way to Alaska. Over the next half a month, we're going to see the eastern heat dome migrate west, join forces with the western dome and it still looks like Nebraska is going to be on the periphery of this. Our temperatures will be running above normal, probably nothing really extreme until we dry out more, which will be happening. The fact that we're on the periphery of the pattern also means that we remain vulnerable to wind storms, but we'll be seeing increased irrigation uh, demand in the rural areas because overall the effect will be to dry out the soils. As far as uh, uh, other things relating to uh, OPPD, uh, I read in one of my science magazines here, uh, $35 per metric ton is now the social cost of carbon emissions attributed by the OMB. Uh, this is an estimate of uh, climate change damages to health, property, and agriculture. Of course, the $35 a ton isn't really being paid at the present. A lot of it's going to be paid by uh, people somewhere down the line. So we're getting the benefit of the cheap electricity now. If it's being generated by coal, and somebody else will be holding the bill later. Of course, $35 a ton is just an estimate, but I wanted to give you people an idea what OMB is saying about it at the moment. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank you. My name is John Tiedemann. I live at 7562 Drexel Street in Omaha, and I am a customer. I'm sure you are all concerned about many of the issues brought to you about the North Omaha coal plant. I think it would be reassuring to the public to have an idea 
what your future plans are for this facility. We get a little nervous when we see you investing large amounts of money into old power plants that the Union of Concerned Scientists has identified as right for retirement because of economic conditions. I'm asking that you provide the public with your strategic plan for the North, North Omaha Power Plant. Thank you. Mr. Gates. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, we're in agreement on uh, developing our strategy going forward. The, if you look at our overall strategic plan, uh, one, one of our strategies is to maintain a diverse power supply for obvious reasons because from, over time various fuel supplies have different issues. With regard specifically to the future of our coal units, that is in our strategic uh, process right now. Obviously it's a big decision on what we do going forward, but we're in that process and when that uh, strategic uh, effort is done, we'll communicate it broadly and, and to the public. But we're in that process right now. Thank you. Joe Peterson, Omaha. Can you, can you state your address, please? 4924 Chicago Street, Dundee. I, um, first of all, I, I wanted to also say that I'm hopeful to see, I'd like to see the strategic plan or read more about the strategic plan for uh, converting to greener, um, more sustainable energy sources. I am concerned about a couple of things. One is the, the Fort Calhoun uh, power plant station and the nuclear waste, what's going to happen uh, from now on out, as well as Cooper Station and the other nuclear power plants in OPPD and how, what kind of strategies you have to shut those down. It will that if, and if you had that as part of your environmental um, plans to move forward, is that, is that in the works? Do you have a, a plan to shut those down? Okay. Especially uh, so Cooper, which is terribly old. As, I mean, for Calhoun as well. Uh, we have, more, we have or Calhoun, we don't have Cooper. Okay. Uh, right now, our plan is to, uh, as we mentioned in my report, is to restart for Calhoun. Its uh, license now would expire in 2033. Uh -huh. uh, we currently have as a waste strategy. We're storing that waste on site, the high level of the fuel, uh, both in dry storage as well as in a spent fuel pool. Um, and that is our, I guess, short and long term plan right now. Yeah. Uh, whether there'll be a permanent repository is still under discussion on a national level. Uh, but our, again, our whole mix uh, we review as we go through what we call integrated resource plan, which is our strategy. With regard to our strategic plan, uh, we've done a lot of work in that. We can provide you that. We also have a sustainability report I think might be of interest to you, and we'll get you a copy of that. Awesome. <coughs> Will you put it on your site then? I'm no, concerned sir. you're saying sustainability is on the way. You're, you're going to start up the, um, th when you said that the startup, you were saying they were going to have plans about when you started up again, the, the site at Fort Calhoun, and I was curious about that. You were saying something about the core and when you would start that up again, and you had some plans around that issue, and that's what I heard, and that's what I was most concerned about. Well, what is that plan, and what are you doing now, and the we're, safety of that plan is concerns we're, me. We're in the process, as I mentioned, of going through extensive safety tests right now on all our systems. Those will have to be completed satisfactorily before we reload the reactor fuel, which we plan on doing. And then we'll go through another series of tests as we bring the plant up to operating temperature and pressure before we uh, return to the service on the electric grid. And then the NRC is the one who gives us the okay, and there will be, be an, yeah, and there will be an NRC public meeting too before that time, and they have not set that date yet. That's right. Thanks. Kathleen Hughes, 3624 Westgate Road. I'm a customer. I'm also a registered nurse, currently working with older patients and with memory issues. Most testimony uh, to the OPPD board about public health concerns, health concerns children, but I'd also like to state that peer-reviewed medical literature and government publications show that coal combustion contributes to the risk of heart attacks, strokes, chronic lower respiratory disease, and compromises intellectual capacity. Although it is difficult to ascertain the proportion of this disease burden that is attributable to coal combustion, even very modest contributions to, this, to these major causes of death are likely to have large, large effects at the population level, given the high incident rates. So even if we're not able to feel coal pollutants causing damage or tied to a specific pollutant to an individual patient, we know that burning coal harms health. 
I'm asking you to replace our polluting coal plant with clean, safe, renewable energy. And then I hear you say it's 30, 2033 before we, we have permission to have it open for 20 more years. That's really frightening. No, there's, excuse me, there's a, that's, you're confusing that with a nuclear power plant. The nuclear power plant is 2033 at the present time. The coal plants, we do not have that in. Okay. All right. We're talking and, about North Omaha coal versus the Fort Calhoun station. Okay. Okay. And then two off, not, not written, um, in comments made by David Corbin. Um, the, bet, the easiest way for us to have uh, solar energy is to everybody get a clothesline. It's right in your backyard, it's free. I'm teaching my grandchildren that. And then the other thing is, I signed up on Earth Day to get the OPPD rebate for having my, for air conditioning. I don't know exactly what it's called, but I've called, since then I signed up then, I've called twice, and I asked them today, and they still haven't put it in, and that was like two months ago. So anyway, let you know that it's they're behind, and we're going to have 90 degree temperatures next week. Right there with Lisa. Got it. Lisa. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your concerns about North Omaha. Hi, my name is Ron Johnson. I live at um, 5904, and it's um, uh, Hanshaw Drive. And I'm concerned about how the coal emissions are going out. Uh, I encourage you to actually consider wind and solar power. It's much cleaner and much healthier for the environment of the earth rather than using um, coal emissions. Even though we don't see the damage that is done to the earth, it's being done and eventually um, the environment of the earth will eventually be eroded because of it. So we need to go to a more cleaner environment, more like wind and solar power. Because the fact is, it's much better for us and our environment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Howdy. Matthew Cronin, 4515 Charles Street. You know, I've come here to speak for a couple reasons. Um, you know, fundamentally, I'm really concerned with the direction of OPPD. I know there's been some benchmarks, 15% renewable in a couple of years, and been doing some good things, um, but it's, it's not enough. We my generation, my kids' generation, we're going to be facing problems and storms and situations that are insurmountable right now if we can keep on course. You know, you have all have a mandate to pursue the most cost-effective means of producing power. And under this assumption, I think it's, or from what I've, what I've gathered, it's we have these traditional means of generating and any extra infrastructure, all those costs are are not included. Um, and so, we have to meet our baseload needs and we have to have the economies of scale size and this we have to have these huge systems to be able to meet our needs my question or my concern is um, that maybe this isn't the best way that could it be that we have an opportunity here you know we're facing you know record heat waves and we're facing you know our, our grid is older than ever and is this even part of the equation in producing in the cheapest power and having the cheapest power we have, um, is that really part of the equation in terms of coal and long-term costs, you know, are the diminished, is the diminished quality and is the, you know, the increased freight. I know you all, fact, you, know, you know, great economists and great, you know, researchers here that all, I'm sure factor a lot of these things in, but how, how does that truly affect the course of this, the public power system? You know, there's been talk today about solar. Um, you know, we have this idea that we need more and more wind farms. But really, you know, if we're not even, if the public power system is, we're renting or getting, buying the power from these individual owners, and then we're all subsidizing the transmission lines, it's better than nothing, but it's still the same old system. Could we have solar in our cities in a way that could really um, help mediate the strain on the grid? You know, we have, you know, during these, you know, what we have today was not meant the digital age was not meant to be run on the grid that we have. Could solar on our public institutions, on our schools, in our libraries, on the police stations, on this building, you know, truly that are already integrated within Omaha, why don't we use these, these places as our step in for solar and as a way to not waste 60% of our power in the transmission and not waste, you know, all the, these children's lives that are sick. So, 
yeah, thank you for your time. I just yeah, we appreciate your uh, comments on distributed generation and and looking to the future in the long term. Hey, Madam Chair, uh, LB one hundred and four <laughs> does cover solar, biomass, and all renewables. Actually, you might want to talk to Ken Winston on that ah. or the other guy too that's interested in solar. There's some incentives there for that. Yeah, and that's that's the thing though. You know, these incentives. They're never going to truly access the neighborhoods that need them most, you know. No tax break's ever going to really bring, you know, solar to North Omaha. <laughs> it's the problem is that, and, and, and yeah, we can get into a great big social discussion, which I would totally agree with you. And nice seeing you again, Matt. You too. Yeah. Okay. My name is Crystal Craig. I, I live at 7110 South 76th Street in La Vista. Um, I'm here again to talk to you about um, my children and the future and um, and I, I'm here to tell you again that I um, I would like to see the North Omaha coal plant shut down. I would like to see Fort Calhoun shut down. It's already been a billion dollars spent. It's been in coal shut down for a long time. Um, and we have so much opportunity right now. Um, you know, one of the things that applies, I think, to everything is, um, you know, when, when something happens that seems like, um, that is uncomfortable, that seems like it could even be a tragedy, you know, really what that is is an opportunity for newer and better. Um, we have the science now to understand that the old way of getting our energy through burning fossil fuels, um, we, we understand now that, that, that there are much better ways that we can do these things. And the idea of let's shut this down and let's shut that down that we've been doing for a long time and we have so much invested and is so reliable, I, I understand how scary that that idea is. It's like anything in anybody's life, you know, but you have got to be positive about it and look at it as an opportunity for change because, I mean, the time is coming, it's now. I mean, really, like, everybody is understanding the science is all over the place. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got your point. We appreciate it. And okay. uh, we'll look at this. With our big thing is we have to balance reliability also. Immediately shutting down both plants at the same time would be sort of a disaster. So well, one well, we are working down. on this and trying to do it in a reliable way, also cost-effective way. Okay, but I think that the difference that we, we have... We can maybe discuss that later. I'd be happy to discuss that Is our time frame? Yes, I we think. are a time frame. Yeah, a few yeah Our time frame is different. I, I understand that you guys are yeah, um, we just, understanding. Yeah, and, but, but I'm telling yeah. you, I know that it's scary, but yeah, we know good it's scary. things are coming. We appreciate and there it. are a lot of people yeah. that are We'll be happy to discuss with that afterwards. idea. So okay. lots more people besides me and us. Okay. That's why we're having stakeholder meetings. Exactly. I, I, so you can educate us on the best way yeah. to and we ask might you wanna, the questions that you no, want us to ask might you. Want you uh, so thank you for oh, allowing me to come up here no, and please speak please. again. And thank you for allowing all of us, okay. you know. Yeah, and, please, and thank please you come to the stakeholder meeting and you'll have an opportunity to actually put in your specific comments again. Uh, I don't know if that was the Which way Which ones? The one in Papillion. I there's quite a few, and, and uh, they so. listed them out here. You can give those, and there are specific things that you can actually write your comments on, specific things, <coughs> and we're trying to open this up to the entire public, all the OPPD customer owners. And we appreciate that. And next we'll take Laverne. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A president's report that was not said this evening or this after this morning, wherever I'm at. <clears throat> I'm, I'm really concerned that the last NRC meeting, we were informed that there were 50 items in which they were to inspect. 30 of them were not ready to be inspected. Nine of them got closed. Now, that seems like the glasses barely have anything in it. You guys are, well, nine are closed, like you're really happy about that. I don't know why the management, which we are paying $400 million over the next 20 years, did not know. We have a vice president of nuclear, we have a brand new plant manager, and under their new guidance, which was supposed to be by your sales pitches, 
going to make this faster, easier with the NRC. It's going to be so much greater with these guys because they have experience. And the first thing that they have to do, they got 30 of them, not even ready. How does a manager not know you're not ready? Are you just learning because, you know, like just walking in and they're saying, well, you got to do this. Well, okay, I'll do that. And then you're just learning on the go. This is highly concerning to me when I see that kind of thing. And that room was dead silent. You were all there. And it was terrible. I just like, oh my God, how do you, how does management not know what's going on in the new plan? Maybe because there's no design basis documents. You told us 250 million, it's a billion. You're, I, didn't, I didn't hear anything about the Moody's downgrade. Not one thing about a possible Moody's downgrade on your debt. Billion and a half and a half a billion, senior and minor. Why aren't these in the president's report? Why aren't negative things being said in the president's report, which would then be a balanced Fox News, fair and balanced. And that's what, I, that's what I'm interested in. And why is that not happening? Why are we not hearing the whole truth, the crane that broke, that was not presented at the, at the NRC meeting uh, back in Elkhorn or back in Blair? Uh, you can remember when your crane broke on Monday and you were scurrying around for a week and we had a meeting on Thursday at the NRC. You made a great presentation, not one mention of the crane breaking. Okay. I had to bring it up because somebody in the toilet told me. Uh, now, I don't want to have nuclear conversations in the toilet to find out what's going on. I'd like to ask you, and I'd like for you folks to tell us, you know, like what okay. happened this week? Anything bad happened this week? Did anybody drop a wrench? Anything this week? Okay. Larry. Okay. I'm not we, trying to be excited. But... We, we, can't we can't comment on a couple of the things. Okay. Uh, first of all, at the meeting, the NRC meeting, the things that they were discussing happened in February and the 1st of March. A lot has happened since then, and we like to deal with the present. Well, I understand a lot has happened. How can I trust when I hear that the management didn't know that 30 items were not ready? That's the last thing I heard. And then I come here and you're like, well, that happened in February. Well, what's happening today? Is there other things that they don't know about that's going on? Well, actually, it was a very good report, and I'll stand by that report right now. Uh, Mr. Gates, if you want to comment on that. Just a couple of context things, uh, Laverne. The, the report context. that uh, was reported on, on May 17th, it wasn't a case of not knowing they were ready. Um, we had presented to the NRC packages that still had some remaining open items. It was our uh, assumption that we would give them the work we had completed and they would review. Uh, we found that they would rather have the completed full package to review, which we have done now on many of the packages. So it wasn't uh, lack of knowledge, it was lack of where, where we, uh, the assumptions going into it. Why was not the full package understood before you went into it? Like, why didn't you know that you had to have the full package when you did that? It, the reason for that is, I mean, the, the issue we had going forward, we had presented that that's what we were going to do. The inspection teams come as an independent body, which is good. And when, when you have an independent body, you're going to have some of these uh, issues come up, which we have addressed in the subsequent inspections, which I referenced today. Also, for contextual purposes, we haven't spent a billion dollars to the shepherd. That number keeps floating around, that's not the case. Okay, 335 million, 20 year upgrade, 143 million Teflon seals, 400 million over 20 years for them. That's 900 million plus tax. It's a billion bucks. Point of order, I think this testifier has been here. Okay. But that was just incorrect. I just gave you the correct numbers. It's a billion dollars over 20 years. You've spent that. You've okayed a billion dollars. Excuse me. I think we're going to let Mr. Gates comment and then thank you for your comments. Okay. So will Mr. Gates continue to say a billion? That's not a billion. It is. We have a big problem here. Why is the management not telling the truth? You've announced three times you're going to restart. It hasn't happened. I can't use the word you're lying, but incompetent might be a great word. Thank you very much. Excuse me. At this and I really time, hope you shut is, it down. Thank that you. is not respectful discourse. Thank well, that, you. That you're incompetent? You just had a different not number. Respectful discourse. <laughs> Morning. Uh, my name is Skip Johnson. I live at 332854th Street in Omaha. I'm retired U.S. Navy, and I would like the coal plant to join me in retirement. <laughs> I applaud the 15% by 2014. I want you to know, though, that I represent a lot of people who can't make it here at 10 o'clock on a workday morning or are too small and too young to understand what's really going on. 
So for those people, for my nephews, for my kids, for my grandkids, for all their friends today and their friends years from now, um, please retire the coal plant. Please. Just please do that. Please be as aggressive as possible with pursuing passionate commitment, passionate commitment to wind and solar that are pretty drought resistant. Please, please pursue with the same commitment that NASA pursued John Glenn's mission, that Rosa Parks pursued what she did in that bus. With the, the system, the highway system, that was created in a phenomenal period of time because it was needed, because of passion and commitment. There are obstacles to every major force. Fiber optics, getting rid of rabbit ears on black and white TVs with satellite. If we can do it for our soap operas, we can do it for all those kids. But we have to present a unified front and we have to embrace the fact that it's the right thing to do and not just the cheapest to do the other thing. Thank you so much for the time and the opportunity to be here today. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for your service. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Scott Kemper. I live at 3845 North 65th Avenue in Omaha. I have a couple things to say. Uh, first, I uh, a few months ago, maybe might have been last year, I came home one day and my power was out. and so I went to the grocery store to buy ice to take care of any food that I was afraid was going to spoil. By the time I got back with my ice, my power was back on. And I thank you for being prompt about getting that taken care of. My other thing is that I think we are being penny wise and pound foolish on a lot of things. I think that it would be nice if we weren't pumping all the pollution into the atmosphere and into the water that we are doing. And I know that you're looking at the different things we can do with the, the coal plants. I would like you to do that more quickly. Um, and I think that we are also foolishly considering having no nuclear power at all. There are safer ways to have nuclear power than we have now. And uh, they're expensive, but it's just like um, it's expensive to have a paved road over a gravel road, but in the long run, it's much better for us. It's much easier, and the, the cost is less. And I think that if we look at safer nuclear options, we'll all be happier. And I know that's not going to happen tomorrow, but I would like everybody to consider that and have that in our long-term plan. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Which is interesting. Commissioner Magwood, is, uh, who is the NRC commissioner, is one of his uh, fortes is studying the third generation nuclear power plants, the new plants. Well, a movie just was released, I don't remember the name of it, but it has the word Pandora in it, and it's about a former anti-nuclear activist have looked at the whole situation, and and I haven't seen it yet. I'm looking forward to seeing it eventually, but it's about building safer nuclear plants, and I hope that we can do that someday. Yeah, we'll we'll continue to follow that research as well, particularly on what's called SMR, small modular reactors, right? And then the Waze reactor, which is being supported by the Gates Foundation. Thank you. Hi, Tom Foster, 5215 North 6th Street, Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, I'm calling here today to ask you to develop a plan um, for the closure of the Fort Calhoun nuclear power plant and the coal-fired plant. And uh, the Fort Calhoun plant, when they pressurize it, when they fire it up, there's going to be a lot of vibration. And if something leaks, if the plumbing that's corroded and embrittled fails, and I put money on it that it will, then you're going to have to scram the reactor. And if you scram the reactor, you're going to have a lot of vibration, violent vibration, which could rattle that whole old power plant into a meltdown. 
<laughs> now, I know the Price-Anderson Act uh, limits the utilities liability in case there's a meltdown, but it would be the largest catastrophe in U.S. history. It would destroy the fresh water supplies for not only our community, but Kansas City, St. Louis, Memphis, Baton Rouge, and New Orleans. Do you really want to have that many Americans furious with you guys? Please learn something about how a nuclear power plant operates and understand that if you're going to dish out $400 million in salary to some guys that won't get the salary if they give you bad news about the plant, you need to take that information with more than a grain of salt because you have a really large responsibility firing up the biggest catastrophe in our country's history would haunt you for the rest of your lives and you need to learn something about, about nuclear power from the union of concerned scientists okay so that's it thank you very much i see that you're very cheerful about that and i wonder if maybe you can discuss a little bit about safe testing to deal with that. Yeah, in the uh, safeguard system, which I mentioned earlier, is going to verify all our safety systems by actually operating them. It's not a many kind of simulation. So that is a big confidence uh, that we've got everything that we need to operate the plant safely. As well as uh, you know, the vibration that's talked about is not, a, not an issue uh, for Calhoun or any other power plant, actually. It just is not an issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Say the 8504 Douglas. Um, I had two questions. Um, one is about simplified, uh, streamlined, uh, one-page uh, solar applications. Uh, any work been done on that? To you know, all uh, in a more practical way, that is something that can move us faster in the direction that a lot of the people here have been wanting to move in retiring that plant or eventually retiring that nuclear plant. Um, the uh, second question I had was about uh, rebates for LED bulbs. Um, Creed just came out with this new fabulous uh, LED bulb, 60 watt bulb that uses only 9 watts. It's the best quality and performance uh, out there for about $13. Uh, I write a blog called Astrosheen and I wrote about that uh, in a um, very modest title named uh, uh, the bulb that'll change the world. What's the name of that bulb, excuse me? Uh, Cree. Cree is the company that makes the chips, the C-R-E-E, -E, that makes the chips that go into a lot of LED bulbs, and this bulb is just phenomenal. And it's available at Home Depot. <laughs> for about $13, so you should uh, start rebating. There's a Philips bulb for 10.5 watt that gives 60 watt equivalent light. And that sells for around that 10 to $15 range. There's a lot of uh, new bulbs uh, at that price range. Uh, with over 70, or this bulb is 90 lumens per watt, which is highly efficient. And I noticed that the bulbs here are still over 100 year technology incandescent bulbs. Thank you. Um, and in terms of your yeah. issue on the, on the thing, Ms. Hutcherson says that she is, uh, is doing it. And so, yeah, oh, on which issue, the Excuse streamlining? Is this, as far as the uh, solar, you want to mention, mention that, please? We appreciate your comment about the, the um, uh, simplified solar form, form, and we're working with that. And I'd like to talk with you after the meeting to go over some specifics, because I think it would be important for us to share that. Any word on LED bulb rebate program? You can discuss that with Tim. Well, I would just say that the, we have done that. We had about a three-year LED, uh, LED CFL uh, uh, rebate program. We continually look at those kinds of things. So for 2014, that will be part of the consideration that we look at. Uh, but we won't have anything for 2013 at this time. But we, but we will look at that. Any de building demonstration project to show, showcase LEDs? That may be something that we consider. We certainly work with a lot of commercial com companies on uh, retrofitting their lighting to a higher efficiency lighting. So we have a fairly sophisticated lighting rebate program for the commercial side of the business uh, where you can get a lot of load peak demand reduced at any one period of time. We've done the CFLs earlier. It may be the opportunity to do the LEDs, and so we'll consider that and take that under consideration. Thank you for that. Okay. And, and then thinking, uh, talking about all the people who have been talking about the the nuclear power plant and all the issues 
it just uh, this the thought just came to my mind that uh, last February I think uh, it, it, it happened. Uh, there's a lot of you know safeguards and things that you can plan for, but last February in Siberia there were there was a meteor shower and a thousand little pieces of rock fell on this town in Siberia and and caused a lot of damage. You know, so there's. <coughs> Uh, you, you know, like the uh, saying by uh, a former defense secretary, the unforeseen uh, unknowables. So there's always unforeseen unknowables that you can't plan for. And, and you, you know, if there is a, a catastrophe, this would destroy the water supply for, uh, you know, millions and millions of people all the way down to the Gulf Coast, which will be a, a, a disaster of monumental proportion. Uh, actually, Mr. Kurtipasi would be happy to answer that one. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. And if you look even uh, post 9-11, one of the processes we put in place is called B-5B, is the regulation from the federal government. But it is for beyond design basis events, you know, whether that includes a, a meteor shower or not. But it may be a similar piece. It's really designed for aircraft or other things that could... Uh, you know, it could be a, a post 9-11 type security issue. So separate procedures, separate water supplies, separate, you know, uh, methods to hook up and, and, and safely shut down the reactor and keep the reactor cool as part of that strategy. And, and that strategy will continue to get enhanced with the work that we're doing from, from post Fukushima. Thank you, Mr. Kurtabasi. Hello, my name is Gus Von Rowan. I'm at 4871 Northwest Radial Highway. And uh, as much as I want to mirror Saeed's uh, suggestions for a lot of technological and efficiencies that we can improve upon. Uh, I'm probably here on behalf of the Metro Omaha Food Policy Council more than anybody. Um, I'm a board member, and uh, but at the same time I'd also like to partner with that. I, I grew up in Wisconsin, and uh, northern Wisconsin in particular, and we don't have any cold plants up there, and I, I've been fishing my entire life. I, I love the fact that I could fish in pristine waters and not worry about what's in, in the fish. And uh, when I came here to Nebraska for Creighton University and I graduated with an anthropology and sociology degree, uh, I realized if I wanted to stick around because I made a lot of friends here, that uh, not only because of agricultural runoff, but it's a very tough place to do fishing because the fish is not really edible in that respect. Mercury emissions are in all fish all over the United States, and coal plants are emitting that. So I am here on behalf of I'd like to shut down the nuclear power plant as well after after seeing a flooded far of a flooded uh, power plant after Fukushima but also because of the coal power plant and I know its emissions are affecting everywhere any or everyone around the world thank you good afternoon I'm a uh, dr. Bobby Davis and I'm here um, as a after working at the university for a while, I think we need to make sure that we have our points one, two, and three. Uh, the, the first one is, uh, two months ago, I left a report, which was a health report talking about the health complications that come from coal. And you have all that, and you've heard it several times, and several people have mentioned it today, so I'm not going to reiterate that, but I just want to keep reinforcing that the health concerns are the major concern. The second point I want to make is uh, the word public, which is a part of your name, that you are here for and on behalf of and as a result of the vote of the public. So we want you to keep in mind that serving the public and not harming the public is your major concern. Not necessarily making money, we don't want you to go broke, but we also want you to know that it's important that the health of the public be a major, major concern. Uh, the last point I want to make is, if you want to really know about it personally, as I do, as a person who has a respiratory disease, maybe it'd be a good idea for you to move to the area. Might be a good idea for your staff and your board to find a house or so in North Omaha in the vicinity of the plant. And we'll have people who live in Warform Home move in your house, and then they, they'll you move in their house, and let you live there and inhale, and day after day after day experience what's going on as far as the health of the individuals in the area is concerned. Thank you very much.
appreciate your concern about the health. Good morning. John Atkinson, Nebraska Wildlife Federation. Um, one thing that hasn't come up is um, I've heard a number of questions about the process and um, progress on redistricting for the election of board members, and I wondered if you could uh, provide us with uh, the appropriate level of detail on that. You didn't come to the, the committee meeting. <laughs> You're right. I didn't. It's all discussed there. Well, Mr. Green can actually is, come is on that recorded too? Because I'd be glad to listen. Yes. I'm sorry. No, it's, uh, <laughs> we'll be happy to answer that. Uh, part. We're still working on it, and we've instructed the board members to uh, uh, review the proposals, and then to uh, uh, give us some, give the committee, the governance committee, some idea of what they were thinking, and then we, uh, the plan was to bring it forward in July and vote on it in August, and then submit it to, hopefully, submit it to the. Uh, uh, power review report in August also and uh, to get it moving along so that by the 1st of October it will be set and everyone will know what it will be. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. If there are no other comments, uh, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you for attending. Charles and we missed yeah, we're a minute. I didn't look at the Yes. Oh, the other thing you need to know. You know, he's just scared to show. Yeah, I've never. Yeah, he was way off. Yeah. Well, and that's very good. Very good. And when it comes to the